Good evening. It's good to see everyone this evening, and it's nicer as we uh, continue to be able to get back to a little bit more normality to to see uh, more and more uh, of us being able to gather together around the Lord and around his word as we do again this evening uh, to continue our uh, studies in the book of Philippians. I'm not sure if uh, you follow the news very closely. Most of the time I try not to follow it too closely. Um, but a few weeks ago the the Prime Minister got into a little bit of trouble whenever he reportedly credited the success of the vaccine rollout in the UK to greed in a meeting with some of his MPs. Uh, he was quoted uh, to have said, the reason we have the vaccine success is because of capitalism, because of greed, my friends. Unsurprisingly, that statement attracted uh, quite a lot of criticism, especially from his political opponents. It's not the only time that we've heard about greed in the news recently. Uh, many football fans were outraged whenever uh, six of the, the bigger clubs in England uh, joined with uh, other clubs from across Europe uh, with plans to start a breakaway European Super League. Fans and pundits uh, alike were uh, full of uh, condemnation as the owners of these big clubs, those that stood to gain uh, the most, tried to convince the watching public that this step up in fortunes for the big clubs would bring benefit to the rest of the footballing community in the long run. Now, of course, my point this evening is not to make any comment on the pros and cons of any specific uh, economic policy, much less to speculate whether any European fo football league that didn't include Aston Villa could possibly be called super. Um, but sometimes the, the, the mindset of, of those in power and authority, especially whenever it seems so self-promoting, makes us examine our own hearts, our own attitudes, and our own mindsets just a little bit. Is it really a bad thing to look out for ourselves at the expense of everybody else? Should we not just take advantage of whatever privilege and position that we have to bring ourselves the most benefit? Should we be so concerned about the needs of others around us, maybe those that we're not actually particularly closely connected to? Well, if you've read uh, the passage that we're going to consider uh, this evening, I'm pretty sure that you're going to think all of those are, are softball questions. Uh, it wouldn't take us to dig too deeply beneath the surface to dispel uh, the, the myths in those questions. Let's turn to Philippians and let's actually start uh, by looking back into the end of chapter 1 and then reading uh, into chapter 2. So let's read from Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. It says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. 
that each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's all we'll read uh, for this evening. <clears throat> we'll continue with chapter 2, God willing, uh, next week. Now, I would like us to go straight uh, tonight to this well known section about the humility of the Lord. We need to ask what it teaches us. What are the implications of, of, of these famous verses? Why is it here? And what is its context? As we examine what these verses have to say about the Lord and about his mindset, his way of thinking, we might find that it is very counterintuitive. That it's difficult for us to accept. That it's something that seems so foreign to us. His natural instinct, his natural way of thinking goes totally against our natural way of thinking. Our normal programming, which is sinful, by default seeks the best outcome for ourselves, not for others. But we discover that he is the opposite. He instinctively seeks the well-being of others first. Now, in order to follow him fully, in order to build Christ-like character, in order to serve him individually and collectively, we must adopt his mindset. We must adopt this mindset presented us in these verses. And tonight we're going to examine more closely what that looks like. And before we get into the details of the passage, I want to just highlight this, this overarching uh, theme that runs through it. You've got to go down to go up. This is the absolutely revolutionary idea that underpins this whole passage. Now, later on, we're going to think a little bit and talk a little bit about what true greatness is and how to achieve it. But the spoiler right at the start of our, our time is that it's usually uh, found in the opposite direction of where we go looking for it. So let's start by thinking about these verses speaking to us about the mind of Christ, starting from verse 6. Again, we'll read them. It says, speaking of the Lord, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. These startling verses, familiar as they might be to each of us, chart the journey that the Lord took as he came to save us. And as we look at these verses and consider them this evening, remember this, that he actively humbled himself repeatedly. These were deliberate actions that he took, and they were actions that the Lord himself took, not things that were done to him. Now, you'll notice that there's beautiful poetry and symmetry in this section. Twice we are directed to consider him. Twice we will see him take a downward step. As God, he emptied himself. As man, he humbled himself. These verses are dealing with divine mysteries as we consider the very nature of God. No wonder these profound ideas have caused much theological debate over the years. And the details can be difficult to understand, but surely the, the overall message is clear to see. 
Here we have the one who is by very nature God. For Christ to be in the form of God means for him to be equal with God. And for him, equality with God was not, it's not something that meant grasping or holding on, but rather giving away. Because that's what the character of God is. So we see him here presented to us, if you will, uh, at the starting point, and we see the direction that he takes, a downward direction. What a contrast this is to the attitudes that we so often see in ourselves and in others around us. How often do we find ourselves grasping for something higher? More authority, more power, more influence, more comfort, more possessions, more, more, more. It reminds me of a very different trajectory that we also read about in the scriptures. A very different aspiration. Read about it in Isaiah chapter 14. And the scene there is of this character, the king of Babylon, one who had ruled oppressively, one who was being greeted as he entered Sheol, as he entered death. And it pictures all of these other rulers and kings of the earth rising up to meet this king of Babylon and almost gloating. You too have become as weak as we. You have become like us. Then they go on to describe his aspirations and attitude. And they say these words from Isaiah 14. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. What a contrast when we consider the one who, who rightly occupied that place in heaven. The one who voluntarily descended. He emptied himself. He took the form of a servant. He was born in the likeness of men. Step after step after step. Downwards. Embracing servanthood. Giving up his rights to be on equal status with the father Gilbert Lennox describes it as. Instead, becoming man. When you read this, do you get any sense of reluctance or of resentment as he takes those steps downwards and towards us? Quite the opposite. What we're seeing here are actions that flow from the way he thinks, the way he naturally chooses to serve, from who he is. And the more we read about him, the more we see this instinctive mindset translated into actions. We see it when we see him washing the feet of his disciples. We see it when we see him having compassion on a multitude and, and feeding them. Or caring enough about a sidelined blind man to stop and to heal him. The attitude of this attitude of humility, service, and sacrifice came naturally to him because it reflects his character. It shows what he is truly like, who he really is. It reflects the character of God. You know, sometimes I read these verses and I can just imagine the angelic audience looking on as the eternal one takes step after step on that downward journey. I wonder, were they shocked as they watched every new length to which he would go? Or on each occasion, did it just confirm with new evidence what they already knew of the character of their creator? We read that he emptied himself. He poured himself out. Rather than an attitude of grasping and, and seizing, he gave up everything. Here was God never ceasing to be God, making himself of no reputation. And how did he empty himself? By taking the form of a servant, a slave. As much as he was truly God, in verse 6, he, became true, he truly became a servant. And he did that by becoming man. And so we read that as God, he emptied himself. What would he be like as man? He would continue in that same 
selfless, giving, sacrificial mindset. As man, he would humble himself. We read in verse 8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. At the beginning of this section that we're focusing on just now, we see one who could go no higher. Any vision that you can think of, of the glory and greatness of God recorded throughout Scripture will be an appropriate one to think of him in these verses. This morning, here, Matt reminded us of that time God caused his goodness to pass before Moses and proclaim before him his name, the Lord. He had to cover Moses' face as he passed by him. Such was the greatness of his glory. Maybe you would think of the one that Isaiah saw and recorded in chapter 6 with the seraphim around him declaring his holiness. Or maybe you would read in Isaiah 40, uh, one of my favorite chapters of scripture of the great God, the creator, the mighty one, the one who measures the oceans in the hollow of his hand, whose understanding and knowledge are incomparable. The one who created, named, and maintained all of the galaxies in our universe. You could think of a God so glorious that as he passed by Elijah, he had to, to wrap his cloak around his face and hear him pass with the sound of a low whisper. Think of any instance you like. Anything that impresses upon you the greatness and the glory of God. And remember that when we read of Christ Jesus... The one who did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. We realize that we're thinking of him. There was no higher height to which he could ascend. And then we watch his journey downwards until we reach this climax. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We read how he humbled himself and we realize that there was no lower point to which he could have descended. He was deserted. He was rejected. He was betrayed. He was misunderstood. He was slandered. He was abused. There was no act of selflessness that he could have made but failed to make. There was no step of, of obedience that he should have taken but that he shied away from. This is the mindset that marked Christ, that he would give everything to secure our salvation. Does that not make you want to worship and praise him this evening as you think of this almighty God who stooped so low for us? Don't we just take him for granted far too easily? Then we just fall into an easy acceptance of what it cost for us to be redeemed. As we consider him in these verses, we witness the greatness of God. Because in God's view, the greatest is not the one who attains the most, but who gives the most. Not the one who climbs to the top, but the one who goes to the bottom. Not the one who is served by all, but who serves the most. And if you're here and you're not a Christian... Allow this description of Jesus Christ to spell all the false notions you have about God and the character of God. And realize what he is like. And realize that the, the, the news about Jesus Christ is called good news for a reason. There is no one who loves you more, who is given more, that he might win you. We couldn't spend enough time thinking about him, meditating on him, glorying in him as we consider this description of, of Christ and of his mindset this evening. Nor could we allow our worship and praise to be set on fire enough as we read these verses. But we have a problem. Paul didn't write these verses primarily to encourage our worship. He described Christ's mindset in all of its magnificent glory so that he could tell us that this is the mindset that we also must Adopt. Verse 5 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. 
And it's true that we ought to adopt this mindset of Christ in relation to every relationship and, and situation of life, and we might consider some of those later. But let's look at the specific context Paul is concerned about. He tells the Philippians he wants this mindset to be adopted among them, among yourselves, he says in verse 5. The NIV states it like this, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. More than anything, this command impacts the way that we treat each other and the relationships that exist within the Christian community. How unnatural is this? How unusual does it look? What does a group of people whose primary objective is the good of the other look like? What a witness it would be to the life of Christ among us if this was lived out among us to its fullest extent. And actually, that witness is a great deal of what Paul has in mind. What he's driving at here and what he's trying to achieve and encourage these believers towards is unity among themselves. And that's why I started reading in, in chapter one, because that's really where the sort of the, the thought flow starts for this passage. In verse 27, um, we read these words, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Have you ever taken part in a tug of war? I've had the opportunity on several occasions, probably at camp or something like that most of the time. In my experience, uh, with apparently little regard for the sort of relative size and strength of the opposing teams, before too long there is an almost overwhelming uh, sense of momentum in one direction or the other. What is it that makes the difference? I have, I have these recollections, uh, probably when I was younger, I don't know, maybe I was taller than, than other kids or bigger or whatever. I was often sort of put at the back of the tug of war. This, this impression of pulling, and it seems like you're pulling your own team as much as everybody else. And the, the team that usually wins in a tug of war are the ones that manage to sort of get their, their whole effort combined, united together, that aren't sort of pulling uh, at odds with each other. It's uh, the, the sort of united front that makes a difference. And that's what Paul is looking for in this Christian church. Total unity as they strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. And yes, they would have opponents. Yes, it would involve suffering and conflict. But what he longed for, what he was desiring would be achieved among them was that they would go forwards in unity, together striving for the faith of the gospel. And, you know, what's at stake here is important. It goes back to this exhortation in verse 27. He wants them to live lives worthy of the gospel. These Philippians were proud of their citizenship as citizens of Rome, but they were also citizens of heaven, and he wanted them to live like that. And it's with this backdrop of, of suffering and conflict that Paul appeals to them for unity. And he bases his appeal at the start of chapter 2 on what the Christians there have in common with him. And the whole thrust of his argument goes something like this. Since we share the comfort that we have from being in Christ and solace from experiencing the love of God, since we are united in the one spirit, complete my joy by being of one mind. That's what he's looking for, unity among them. And he actually says it three or four, time, three or four different ways to emphasize his point there. Be of the same mind. Have the same love, be in full accord, and have one mind. This, says Paul, is what will complete his joy. Now, you might remember that he started speaking about uh, the joy that they brought him in his prayer earlier in chapter 1. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always, in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. 
because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. The fact that these believers had partnered with him in the gospel had brought him such joy, despite the danger to themselves, despite the fact that so many others were, were turning away from Paul and uh, ignoring or rejecting or actively working against him, these believers had confirmed their support for him. And it meant so much to him. But there was a danger. And the danger that he highlights in these verses, the risk that existed was that they would allow their selfish ambition and their vain conceit to disrupt the unity, their unity and their common stand for the gospel. And that's the background to what are actually some pretty plain statements in verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. There's nothing really difficult about what these verses mean. It's not all that hard for us to understand them. We don't even have to think very far to think of examples of how this teaching might change our attitudes and our behaviors. The problem is not understanding these verses. The problem is living them. Just try and think of, of different scenarios that they might come into play in your life. Somebody has an open door for the gospel, but they need support. It's not really your thing. Maybe it's help with the kids club. Maybe it's partnering with them as they assist those facing poverty. Maybe it's working with them in an evangelistic Bible study with a few friends. It'd be easier just to leave them to it. But what happens when you apply these verses? What happens when you count them more significant than yourself? When you look out for their interests, not just your own? What happens when you're not focused on your agenda, but you prioritize theirs? You're not on the rota for anything this week. That would be a miracle, actually, if you manage to go through a week without being on the rota for something. But you see someone else that has a crazy schedule, a busy home life, a lot of responsibilities here, and despite the fact that you have enough things on your own to-do list, these verses would encourage you to, to, to look at their interests, to, to see how you can support and encourage them. It struck me that maybe it's actually at home that this mindset can often be lived out most fully. Maybe you're a partner to an unbelieving spouse. Maybe you have housemates who are unbelievers. Maybe you have children growing up and learning the gospel and forming a view of God by what they see in you. And how does what Paul instructs the believers at Philippi to behave in relation to their fellow believers, how does it feed into each of those circumstances? Maybe you've convinced a colleague to attend an evangelistic event. Do you think that observing a group of people exhibiting this mindset of Christ as they interact with each other would stand in stark contrast to what they see every day in the office or in their home? I would hope so. So imagine what this looks like. A community of God's people whose primary ob objective is to look out for the interests of each other and to sacrificially give themselves to support one another in the ultimate goal of sharing together in the gospel. That is what Paul is appealing to, appealing to these Christians to be. And that would not only complete his joy, but fill them with joy as well. So I want just to step back for a moment and to try and think of the relevance of, of all of this a little bit more. The mindset that we're being asked to adopt is one of sacrifice, one of putting others first. It is deliberately taking a downward direction, not constantly straining higher and after more. And this is completely at odds with some of the most common thinking in our culture and in our society. 
that mindset or, or way of thinking that actually embodies so much of what we see around us, what we hear in the news, what we see being worked out in the policies within our workplaces has its origin in uh, a mindset or a way of thinking called critical theory. And we do plan to examine this ideology and how it impacts our culture um, and uh, our society uh, and I think it's the next Thursday night study, so not this Thursday, but the week after. But I want just to focus on a couple of things here this evening. Not to talk about it in any level of detail, but just to focus on a couple of things. Critical theory is all about power dynamics. It looks at every relationship through the lens of a power struggle. Dividing people into groups of oppressed and oppressors around a variety of different characteristics, things like race or gender, different things. It regards power and authority as fundamentally oppressive. And its primary aim is to achieve the liberation of the oppressed groups. And when we study it in more detail, we will examine the, the positive things that it affirms, the, the, the truths that it does affirm, the places where it agrees with the gospel. But we'll also recognize that this ideology that, that really is at the back of much of the thinking in our world, in our Western society, it impacts so many different narratives relating uh, to social justice, to gender, to sexual identity, to race in a very negative way. But for tonight, I just want to highlight two specific things. I want to see how it conflicts with what Philippians Two shows us about the character of the Almighty. And secondly, I want to see how the struggle for liberation is at odds with a mindset of willing humility. So very briefly, we'll think of how it conflicts with what this chapter shows us about the character of the Almighty. The idea is that power and authority is fundamentally oppressive. That idea is shown to be false by the Almighty God, the one with ultimate power and authority, yet the one who willingly and deliberately acted in humility and service. And secondly, that struggle for liberation. The goal that is presented to us is not one for ever upward progress and a, a struggle for progress, but a desire to go downwards, not one that insists on our own rights and everything that we could achieve, but rather to willingly seek to favor others rather than ourselves. And as I say, we will look at this in a bit more detail shortly because some of the ideas that this theory is responsible for are in direct conflict with the gospel. And it will be important for us to dig into them in a bit more detail and try and understand how our society how the mindset of, of many of our colleagues and friends is subtly shaped and influenced by these ideas. But let's get back to our text for this evening. We focused a lot on the downward trajectory that the Lord took. Of course, that's not the whole story. I said at the start that an underlying argument of this passage is that you go down to go up. That humility is the pathway to greatness. But first, answer this. How do you define greatness? <clears throat> this is something that the Lord's disciples were extremely preoccupied with. The Gospels record numerous occasions where they discussed and argued over who was the greatest among them. And famously, of course, James and John sought to, have, to be seated on the left hand and the right hand of the Lord in glory. In Mark 10, we read in verse 35, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one on your left hand and one on your right, one on your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. Just look at their, their language. We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. It reminds me of a 
kid wanting uh, the answer uh, before they actually tell you what it is that they're asking for. But look at how graciously the Lord replies them. What do you want me to do for you? Even in this circumstance, to see the, the graciousness of his character uh, overflowing to them. The Lord explained to them that what they were asking for was not his to give. But in any case, he pointed them instead at his suffering and asked if they were able to join him in that. And he went on to explain what greatness in his kingdom looks like. The same chapter from verse 43. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. They thought that greatness was about sitting on a throne. He told them that greatness was being a slave to all. That was the pattern that he set. It's ironic, isn't it, that as they would argue over who was the greatest, even on the eve of his crucifixion, he would stoop and wash their feet. This example is, is one of the clearest parallels in his life of the mindset behind his whole incarnation and death. We read about it in John 13. It says, during supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Even the language here reminds us of what we read in Philippians 2. Without any fuss or reluctance, watch him as he rises from his place at the table, lays aside his outer garment, takes a slave's attire, pours some water and quietly begins to wash the disciples' feet, the chore of a slave. Notice his supreme confidence in God. He had nothing to prove, no sense in which he had to justify himself, so he did what he had always done. He put the interests of others ahead of himself and stooped to serve them. He demonstrated once again what true greatness looks like. He demonstrated once again what the character of God is. Is like. And what this world would consider lowliness, weakness, humiliation even, God saw a character that delighted his heart. Not just that incident in the upper room, but in every action his son took, every street side beggar that he healed, every blind person to whom sight was restored, every hungry person fed, every outcast welcomed, every sinner forgiven. And supremely, in his greatest act of obedience and sacrifice, his death on the cross. And so we get to verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now it's not only that angelic host that witnessed his steps of humility that will witness his exaltation. All of creation will one day be directed to worship the exalted Christ. God points to him and says, this is what true greatness is. What truth about Christ would you point to, to highlight his greatness? There's so much that we could think of. He commands our awe for so many reasons, but it is because of his humility and sacrifice that God has highly exalted him. 
As I said, he commands our awe for many reasons, but the primary refrain of our praise eternally will be this. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. For us to grow more like Christ is to increasingly adopt his mindset. That the way he instinctively thought will become the way that we naturally think. That we will more quickly think of others than ourselves. That we will realize that there is no way to fully know Christ without following his pathway. That we would realize that progress in the Christian life follows Christ's pattern of death and resurrection as we repeatedly die to ourselves and to old ways of thinking and have his new way of thinking formed in us. As we consider this passage, this first part of Philippians 2 this evening, let us allow our minds and our hearts to worship and to rise in praise to our God as we see his greatness demonstrated to us. But let us also seek him and beseech him that he would continue to develop this mindset within us. Let us be real about the fact that this is dying to self. This is putting our own interests to, 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 the, to the back, putting them secondarily. And it is seeking uh, to take that attitude of service that our Lord demonstrated in everything he did and for that to be the thing that permeates the Christian community that we form here. And let that be the basis on which we continue to go forwards and to strive side by side for the faith of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we just are in awe as we uh, think about your son, the Lord Jesus, as we, as we see his character and his actions uh, displayed uh, before us in this chapter in Philippians 2, but of course in history, as we see how he would, uh, uh, how he would rise, as it were, from his throne, just like he rose from the table uh, with those disciples, and how he would step down, how he would uh, make himself nothing, of no reputation, how he would not seek to hold on to anything, but that he would give everything for us. Lord, it is true that so often we can become so uh, complacent and so relaxed about what it actually costs uh, to provide salvation for us. But we bow to worship you and to praise you that what we see in your son, despite the, uh, the infinite cost, is actually just the very heart of God displayed before us. So we worship you and praise you. We pray that you would help us, that we would uh, adopt this mindset, that we would just do as Paul was urging uh, the Philippians to do, to allow this mind to dwell among us. And we pray, Lord, that in all of our interactions with each other, in all of our relationships with each other, that this is the approach that we would take. That for your sake, for the sake of your son, for what he has done, we would seek to follow him, to put others ahead of ourselves, to be willing uh, to take those uh, steps of, of humility, uh, following his pattern, that that might be to his greater praise and glory. So we ask it this evening as we give you our thanks in the Saviour's name.